Okay, so let us get started with today's session on uh, the workshop on research methodologies and uh, I am going to continue yesterday's discussion of random variables. I will extend it today with a discussion of hypothesis testing. So, let me actually before I start talking about hypothesis testing respond to some of the feedback that I saw on Moodle yesterday. Uh, and in that sense let me clarify that the purpose of the introductory talks I am giving you on the essence of statistics is not to set you up with a tutorial on how to deal with the data sets that you have. So, at this point all I am doing is trying to elaborate on various issues that you need to be aware of and trying to clarify basic concepts that you need to take into an analysis of your own problem. So, I am deliberately staying away from taking up data sets and kind of sitting down tutorial style okay, trying to work out various measurements for instance of centrality as we discussed yesterday. So, all of that will be available in a later context. So, one of the things that Professor Fartak mentioned to you early on was that we do not end our engagement with you with just a set of talks. So, throughout the rest of the year until presumably we have a secondary workshop following this, we will remain in touch via Moodle and via Moodle I will elaborate on some of the technical aspects that some of you are raising for example, relating to specifics of the application of a particular test relative to the hypothesis that you are testing. So, again to recap all I wish to do is to point out the importance of properly setting up a hypothesis test and I do not wish to talk about the nitty gritty of evaluating very specific problems from a numerical standpoint. So, it is important to get the concept straight first in an introductory workshop and we will follow this up later on with a more elaborate discussion on offline okay, using Moodle. So, then to recap what we did yesterday in terms of a discussion of random variables. So, remember what we were uh, trying to do we, we observed that when we do our experiments we have started off with some physical model which we wish to prove or disprove and that physical model has in it a collection of parameters. Okay. For example, when we talked about identifying a distribution of heights the most relevant parameter was the population mean mu. So, we then realized that to get an estimate of the population mean mu you needed to work with a sample. So, if you are working with a sample okay, you need to start collecting individual measurements and we said the merit of collecting individual measurements was that if you looked at any individual that individual's height gave you an estimate of mu the true global population average. So, the expected value of a measurement was going to be mu, but we then spent some time, uh, time trying to discuss why it was more relevant to look at a collection of measurements together rather than at looking rather than looking at individual measurements. And we said that that comes about because when you look at an individual measurement you do learn about mu, but the variance associated with that measurement is fixed it is sigma square. Whereas, the moment you start looking at the sample mean the sample mean tells you about mu all right, but the massive advantage you have when you work with an arithmetic mean of a set of samples is that its variance now is a function of the sample size and if you control the sample size you can start getting more and more refined estimates of the population parameter. So, in other words at this point you already have a strong incentive to keep sampling more and more okay, and then averaging your measurements and that starts giving you a true refined estimate of whatever it is you are trying to find. So, that I graphically pointed out to you as okay, a task where you look for a point estimate in this case a point estimate of the uh, uh, population mean mu okay, which we decide is x bar and then we said that we wish to find an interval around this mu because we know that our measurements are themselves random variables okay, and therefore, anything computed from a collection of random variables is in turn a random variable. So, therefore, x bar is forced to be a random variable which in turn means it could change from day to day as you do your experiments. So, x bar therefore, now not only has to be talked about in, in the context of a point estimate, but you also need to know what range of values you might reasonably expect to find x bar within and that is our interval estimate. So, we said really it boils down to now asking if you are making a statement about mu is the x bar that you ex expect to see 
close enough to mu within a certain tolerance, a certain tolerance here defined by the parameter delta. Now, this was true for heights, but this was also true for if you remember I kept going back to that acceleration due to gravity example okay, for g, where there is a hypothesis that the value of g is 9.8 and the question is would a set of experiments allow you to confirm that it was 9.8 meters per second square. So, before we get into the actual nitty gritty of a hypothesis test, I want to kind of step back and look at how the entire scientific method for performing a hypothesis test has come about. And so, let us look at okay, the history of the scientific method and it goes back to somebody called Karl Popper and what is now called critical rationalism. So, if you want a quick summary of this, you can go to Wikipedia and look up both Karl Popper and also critical rationalism. And the insight that he comes up with is that it is much easier to prove a statement false than it is to prove something true. Okay. And in fact, this reflects almost every single domain of our existence now. So, essentially the way this reasoning goes is that if you want to prove something true, you probably have to do a large number of experiments, look through all possible scenarios and then finally, come to the conclusion that something is true, because basically you have not seen a contradiction to whatever you are proposing. On the other hand, all it takes is one contradiction to your theory. Okay. In other words, we, we come up with this one contradiction to prove a notion false and that shoots down the original hypothesis. So, for example, if I start with the hypothesis that all crows are black, all it takes is for me to see one white crow and that shoots down the hypothesis that crows are black. Okay. So, it comes back to this observation that it is easier to do a set of experiments till you find a contradiction as opposed to doing a very large number of experiments looking for a contradiction and not finding one and then finally, concluding that a notion is true. Okay. So, this in a sense is rooted in practicality. We want to get to the root of a hypothesis, we want to make a decision about a hypothesis, but with the least number of experiments okay, that we can possibly undertake. So, it turns out that several people have thought this way. So, Karl Popper himself writes that the criterion of scientific status of a theory is in its falsifiability. Okay. Can you prove something false or can you refute it or can you test it? And in fact, Einstein is thought to have said, okay, though there is no definitive evidence of this that he's actually said it. He say, he's thought to have said that there is no amount of experimentation that can ever prove him right, but a single experiment could however prove him wrong. So, it's with this mindset that we go about talking about how to set up a hypothesis in whichever domain it is that you are working in, whichever problem it is that you are working with. Okay. There is a statement that you will make about the physical model you are working with, about a parameter in the physical model that you are working with. Okay. And so, that physical param that uh, model parameter that you are working with, okay, the essence of what we are going doing now is asking, can we set up experiments where we try to prove something wrong about what you believe about that parameter. So, fundamentally then what we wish to do is to design an experiment, where the emphasis is on proving the hypothesis wrong. This is actually quite easy to see in a couple of domains. So, the first is think think of the legal system that we have. Okay. So, what, what, what happens with our legal system? We are aware of the fact that people are innocent until proven guilty. So, therefore, in our legal system who has the burden of proof? of trying to prove guilt or innocence. Okay. So, inherently the prosecution in any trial has the burden of trying to prove guilt beyond the shadow of a doubt. Okay. And the defense, the accused person does not have to prove his innocence. Okay. And so, the way this works, if the prosecution does not prove guilt beyond the shadow of a doubt and actually both parts of this are important. prove guilt and shadow of a doubt and we will come back to this in the context of a hypothesis test a little later. But if the prosecution does not prove guilt beyond a shadow of a doubt, then the accused must walk away free. Now, notice something when the accused walks away free that does not mean that the accused is innocent. Okay. That does not mean the accused is innocent in the sense that the crime has not been committed. It just means that there has not been enough evidence demonstrated that the accused Okay, was truly innocent. So, it is in other words once again easier to prove okay, that 
there is not enough evidence out there to prove a hypothesis okay, and therefore the accused walks away from the uh, uh, from the trial okay but it is possible of course that the accused remains actually inherently guilty of this but has escaped without being caught to some extent the hypothesis testing that we do okay reflects this it is possible that occasionally we will get the conclusions of a hypothesis test wrong okay but the fact of the matter is we will follow a procedure where we look to test a statement and prove the innocence or guilt of that statement and once in a while we will get it wrong so the second example where the scientific approach okay follows this aspect of falsification is actually in uh, biology where you look at the production and testing of pharmaceuticals so if you think of a clinical trial okay so let's look at the situation where somebody has discovered a new molecule in their laboratory and claims that it's a new drug against cancer so if it's supposed to be a good drug against cancer okay ideally you go test it out on a bunch of people who have cancer and prove that the disease improves the kind the state of the disease improves well the state of the patient improves so it boils down to now comparing a set of people who have taken this drug and whose health is presumably improving versus a set of people who are not taking this drug and their health hopefully is not improving okay and that to the pharmaceutical company in turn proves that the drug works and that they should therefore go ahead and manufacture it and by the way this is big business each new drug that's put out particularly of a biological origin costs order of a billion dollars to research and put out and that's basically because it subsidizes the cost of failures with all the other trials for all the other candidate molecules so therefore it's extremely important for a company for a pharma company to do all the statistical tests and prove the hypothesis that the molecule that they are about to formulate and produce and sell is actually an active ingredient which can actually improve okay and diminish the effects of a disease so now the clinical trial is set up in a very curious way of course you got to find volunteers for this okay, and typically people who are in a very bad shape with their health come forward to participate in a clinical trial you need a reasonable number of people participating participating in a clinical trial and we saw that okay yesterday in the context of needing a large sample size if you wish to converge to the truth about something so with a clinical trial okay it's now a situation where you take this active molecule that you have a active ingredient that you have okay and you want to give it to a set of people and you want to be able to say that this molecule actually does what we claim to see in the lab in other words that it reduces the symptoms associated with the disease so the catch with this is okay you have got to actually now prove that this molecule does better than anything else out there so it's not enough to simply say okay that this molecule when given to a patient reduces the effects of the disease okay it's also possible that the very act of a doctor putting on a white coat and giving a tablet to some patient that might itself make the patient feel a whole lot better about the state of his health and that might be the true underlying cause of why he feels better okay so if you reason out that there are other variables which potentially might make a patient's health improve and not the drug itself then in performing a hypothesis test you've got to control for the effect of other variables so the other variables here are the fact that okay there's a fairly uh, uh, kind of sophisticated setting in which the doctor goes about okay dealing with the patient okay invariably you wear a white lab coat that makes the patient feel a whole lot better okay there are plenty of nurses around that makes the patient feel a whole lot better and then of course okay you make an elaborate deal of giving out a set of tablets hand them over and that automatically as i said makes most of us feel better that our concerns have been addressed and that we are going to be cured in a short while so this of course is well recognized in the medical literature and what in fact is now suggested is that while giving out the active ingredient to a set of people there must be another set of people who receive at the same time from the same doctors and nurses dressed in the same way okay they must receive an identical looking set of tablets but these tablets rather than having the active ingredient in them are just sugar pills okay so these by the way are called placebos so you have a situation therefore where you have two groups of people 
okay. And you can see the making of a very elaborate experiment here. There are two groups of people. One group will get for themselves the active ingredient. The other group will go without the active ingredient, but are getting the sugar pills. Everything else about the entire activity is identical. Okay. The same sets of doctors, the same sets of nurses, everything else is identical. And what you hope to figure out is that if the two groups of people are dealt with over a period of time, okay, each receiving either sugar pill or the active molecule, then you wish to look at these patients from these two groups after an interval of time to see whether their health has improved. And of course, the whole motivation behind doing this is that the active ingredient hopefully improves somebody's health. And so, as a pharma company, what you want is to of course hope that the result turns out to be positive with respect to the active ingredient. But notice a very subtle thing. Okay. You are not out to prove that the active ingredient works on each and every patient you can find. All you are out to prove is that the active ingredient that you are giving out is doing better than a sugar pill. So, we set up a very simple hypothesis which you then essentially are trying to prove false which is that of the two groups of people who are getting pills, the simple hypothesis that you are setting up is that both groups will effectively behave the same way and the end result of taking the tablets is the same. Okay. So, that of course, is not what you want to happen. What you want to happen is for the active molecule to do better. But by actually not setting the bar for the active molecule so high and in fact, doing the reverse and setting the bar for the active molecule so low, what you end up saying is that look, let us compare whether the active molecule does the same as a sugar pill and hopefully the answer comes back that it does not do the same as a sugar pill. In which case of course, the interpretation is that it does better than the sugar pill and therefore, it is indeed truly active. In which case you start your manufacturing process and market your drug. Okay. But technically look at what is happening. What you have ended up doing is that you have ended up saying that the molecule is better than a sugar pill or at the least it is not equivalent to a sugar pill. Okay. Now, there is a difference between saying that and saying that the active the mo molecule you have just manufactured and tested is the best molecule out there okay, for curing this particular disease. So, we are doing essentially a test of the activity of a molecule okay, by falsifying a hypothesis that the molecule does nothing, okay, which is not necessarily an intuitive thing to do, but on the other hand it is an easy thing to do because all it takes is a small group of people and you prove that the active molecule okay, does better than a sugar pill for a small group of people. So, the entire philosophy of what we are going to talk about and I am going to demonstrate this using a series of graphs in the various contexts and we will ask what influences this kind of methodology. So, all of this now is in the context of setting up a hypothesis where the focus is on falsifying it. Now, what is the alternative to this? So, if we did not set up something to prove it wrong, then we are actually working towards inductively reasoning further and further looking at more and more evidence okay, and then trying to prove that something actually works. And this is actually the way most of us in fact, this is how for example, traditional medicine in India has been practiced. There is lots of empirical evidence that certain herbs for instance improves your health and we keep taking these okay, and it is more a matter of induction. If you take this kind of herb, your health will improve in that form and you keep going like this. Okay. But there is no systematic test where you are comparing it against another control group and all you are looking for is with a series of experiments where you keep doing this from the learning that you get, you, re, you induce the reasoning that the, the preparation that you are taking actually improves your health. Okay. So, now the problem with this is that it takes you a lot of effort and therefore, a lot of personal experience before you finally come to this realization that some herbs are good for you and in fact, that is what our Ayurveda for instance does for us. There is lots and lots of historical evidence that some herbs matter, but that is not the kind of insight which came to us very quickly. It took us generations before we could finally come to the conclusion that some herbs were good for specific okay, diseases. So, I repeat something I put up yesterday when we were talking about statistics, okay, because this is even more critical now in the context of a hypothesis test, which is that as we get into for carrying out a hypothesis test, we are not asking whether something that is being tested is scientifically significant or not. All we are going to focus on is whether the procedure for proving significance is fair or not. Okay. 
So again, I do not know which domain your problem is in. I do not know what parameter you want to evaluate and hypothesize about. But all that we are going to do is assume that once you have already set up your problem, once you have already identified what needs to be tested, how do you now go about testing for the statistical significance of a claim? Okay. So go back to this business that we have a point and interval estimate for anything that we wish to comment about. So it boils down to saying that a hypothesis has okay, a comment being made about a population parameter in a physical model. So again it is important to understand the sequence of events in all of this. So before you even go about doing an experiment and collecting your measurements and looking into your measurements and trying to infer something and this is actually a very important point because most of us are guilty of not doing it in this fashion. So before you even perform an experiment, you must have known what physical model it is that you are going to evaluate and you must have identified what parameter in that model you are going to test. Okay. So of course, the parameter in this model is a population parameter and what we mean by that is it cannot change as a function of the experiment that you are seeing. It cannot change as a function of samples. So yesterday when we talked about okay, the heights of people, you know, we talked about how that alien coming down from Mars was required to figure out the average height of a human being and then relay that back to Mars. So the alien has to report a population parameter. The alien is not expected to report a, a value of an average height as a function of his or the samples of heights that he or she sees. Okay. So remember that whenever we make a comment about a hypothesis, that comment is always going to be about a population parameter in a model, but that comment for that comment to be made of course we are going to have to collect measurements and that comment will therefore ultimately arise by looking or comparing our sample measurements against a claimed value of a population parameter. So if I go back to acceleration due to gravity, if somebody comes up with a theory saying that the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second square, that is a hypothesis, okay. that is a physical model. Okay, describing gravity and in that physical model there is this parameter g and that parameter g through some reasoning is being assigned a value 9.8 meters per second square. Now my role in all of this is to ask the question will my experiments and my data turn out to be consistent with 9.8 meters per second square. So it boils down to therefore asking when our measurements are taken and when we compute an x bar, so hopefully you can see on the x axis of this plot that what I am actually plotting is not my individual measurements x, but I am plotting x bar itself. So again remember the entire focus on sampling yesterday, once we realize that working with the sample gives us a much better way to converge to mu, we stop looking at individual measurements, we are always going to look at an arithmetic mean given a collection of measurements. But remember that the arithmetic mean itself could change depending on the collection of samples you have inside it. Okay, so the arithmetic mean itself is a random variable and so therefore what this curve, what this distribution in this plot is telling you is that there is a range of values that the arithmetic mean could take depending on which measurements, individual measurements you collect and therefore the arithmetic mean could therefore vary somewhere around the true mean mu. So x bar could be anywhere around the true mean mu and it is our job to figure out what interval x bar might line reasonably such that the proposal being made about the population parameter is accepted. So therefore, the hypothesis test about the value of a population parameter will be accepted if x bar lies in some interval around mu, ideally of course x bar is mu, but it is very unlikely that our measurements will be so precise that we will get the true value. So therefore, what we ultimately hope for is x bar should be near mu. Okay, within some tolerance interval okay, and it boils down to figuring out what this tolerance interval is and for that matter okay, what this area that I am showing you outside this tolerance interval is and that area if you look at my notation says alpha by 2 on both sides of this interval. So one of the things going ahead is we will have to figure out what this alpha is, what is an interpretation for this alpha and how do we ultimately control the effect of this alpha. Okay. So just looking at this sketch if I move my thresholds out, so this thresholds at mu minus delta and mu plus delta now start working kind of like a goal post. 
if our measurements fall within the goal post, then we end up saying that whatever is being said about the original population parameter is fine, we have to accept whatever has been claimed. But if our measurements fall outside it, then there is reason for us to not believe the statement about the population parameter. So, I will give you one more example before we go ahead. So, go back to that coin toss experiment that we had yesterday. So, we had 100 tosses of a coin, we said the coin was a fair coin, in which case we should have seen 50 heads. So, mu should be 50 if it is a fair coin, but then we said if you actually perform the experiments, you are unlikely to see precisely 50, you might see 45, you might see 55, you might even be extremely unlucky to have this unusual occurrence of 20 heads in 100 tosses happen to you. Okay. And now, you can see a issue arising. If you were to see 20 heads out of 100, what is your conclusion about that coin? Okay. So, if the hypothesis that started off the whole experiment is that your coin is a fair coin and you are now seeing 20 heads in an experiment out of 100, do you accept that the coin is a fair coin or do you instead go over to the conclusion that the coin is a biased coin. And so, you now have to make a choice between two alternate okay, conflicting hypotheses. So, to decide between these two hypotheses, you need to set for yourselves a goal post and this is what we are precisely doing in this sketch. We have set ourselves a goal post defined by this parameter delta and it is also defined by this area that I am showing you outside this goal post. So, the value of delta will depend on in turn alpha we are not getting into the algebra of all of this, okay. but graphically just appreciate that if I keep alpha small, if I make alpha small that basically means I am moving my goal posts outwards, I am moving it wider and wider apart, that basically means delta is becoming larger and larger and that means I am looking at more and more of a probability of finding my measurements of x bar to lie within this interval. Okay. So, it comes down to the goal post and these goal posts are critical to us in accepting a hypothesis result okay, or from a test or not accepting it. So, the procedure therefore, is going to be find yourself a model, find yourself a parameter in the model you wish to make a comment about, propose for that parameter a value that you think pertains in a population sense. Okay. We are still not looking at samples, we are still not performing an experiment, we are not looking at individual measurements yet. So, before any experiment is done, you are doing all of this and once you have got okay, your goal post defined and to define a goal post, you are either choosing delta or else you are telling us what alpha is. Once you have done this, now we will get down to the business of collecting measurements, computing from our measurements x bar and then asking does x bar lie within the interval or does it lie outside the interval. And if x bar lies within the interval, the conclusion is that h naught may be accepted. If it lies outside the interval, then it implies that the hypothesis that we are talking about may be incorrect okay. and our preferred interpretation is that the hypothesis is wrong. So, it boils down to a statement about the population parameter and that statement I just called it h naught, the formal term for it is the null hypothesis and it is critical to realize that the statement being made has nothing to do with the samples that you are collecting, but it is about a population value. Okay. This is a common mistake most people make. So, this could be about any parameter in any model. So, if you are looking at a distribution of heights, you may be interested in the mean value for the height and in the variance of the height. If you are looking at a linear model, for example, between force and mass, maybe you are trying to make a comment about whether g equals 9.8 meters per second square or not, that is your null hypothesis. Okay. So, depending on whatever it is that you are studying, as a physical model, identify the population parameter in it and then make a comment about what value it ought to take and then start asking the question whether there is a possible way to collect measurements to make a comment about it. Okay. So, therefore, to test this hypothesis about a population parameter, there are two parts to this test. One is compute a test statistic and what, what, what is the statistic? Just to recap, anything computed from sample data is going to be called a statistic. Okay. So, to make a comment about a hypothesis, we need that population parameter and we need a statistic which in turn will compute given a collection of sample data and then we also need to know which distribution on which we are going to plot or sketch the statistics. In other words, we need to know what is the shape of this distribution, 
we need to know where are the goal posts on this distribution and then we need, need to know where is our sample okay, statistic going to end up falling relative to the goal posts. Are we on the inside or are we on the outside of this interval? So, invariably the doubt is how do you formulate the test hypothesis. So, the null hypothesis H naught is the hypothesis that we wish to test and if you go back to what I said about the scientific method, what we want to do with the null hypothesis is not to prove the null hypothesis right, okay, but we want to prove the null hypothesis wrong. Okay. So, invariably what we are out to do is to prove the null hypothesis wrong. For example, with a clinical trial with a drug, we wanted to prove that the null hypothesis that the active molecule is equal to a sugar pill, that was a hypothesis. We want to prove that the null hypothesis is wrong and by proving it wrong, indirectly we are saying that the active molecule is better than the sugar pill. Okay. With even with our legal system, the null hypothesis we wanted to prove wrong. We wanted to prove that there is somebody is guilty. Okay. We want to prove that somebody is guilty, but to prove them guilty, okay, you have got to take the effort of collecting the evidence and showcasing beyond a significant doubt that somebody is guilty and by default if you cannot prove them guilty, then they go away as not guilty, okay, which brings us to okay, that point I made before. Okay. If you set up X no, H naught as X is guilty and you cannot prove it, that does not mean that X is innocent. All you have ended up showing is X is not guilty and the difference between X is not guilty and X is innocent. Okay. That subtle difference is almost like, look, I have not been able to prove your guilt, but hopefully if more data comes my way, if more evidence comes my way, I might then be able to change my mind and prove that you are indeed guilty. Okay. So, the, for example, if the active molecule you worked with turns out not to be too different from a sugar pill, then you have not been able to differentiate between the two. But technically, all you have ended up showing is that the active molecule is reasonably like a sugar pill, but that does not still mean that more data cannot come along which allows you to then differentiate the active molecule from the sugar pill. Okay. So, it is a slightly subtle thing which is that when we set up a, a statement H naught, we want to prove it wrong. Okay. We want to prove H naught wrong and when we fail to prove H naught wrong, we do not go ahead and say H naught is right. All we say is H naught was not shown to be wrong and there is a big difference between saying H naught is not shown to be wrong and saying that H naught is right. Now, the moment you come up with one statement of H naught, which is what you ultimately want to test, the question comes up what is an alternate statement. So, if you are talking about guilt, the alternate statement is about innocence, that is straightforward. But in engineering problems, it is not always straightforward what is the alternate statement that you can come up with. For example, if I am making a comment about some model parameter theta, okay, and I am making the comment that I think according to my calculations that theta theta should take on the value theta naught. For example, acceleration due to gravity should take on the value 9.8. That statement has many possible alternatives. For example, the most obvious alternative and in fact, the direct complementary statement to H naught is that theta is not equal to theta naught, but theta naught equals theta, uh, theta naught allows you to take on any value other than 9.8. Okay. But you might want to be more restrictive for example, and say that the theta is less than theta naught. If you have some reason to believe that the true value of the parameter you are testing may be less than what is being claimed, then you might want to propose that as an alternate statement. Okay. And conversely, you might want to go on to the other side. You may have some belief that theta is greater than theta naught. For example, if theta is the activity of a drug okay, in some way in your clinical trial and a high theta is a good thing as far as the drug is concerned, then really what you want theta to be is to be greater than theta naught, where theta naught is the value for your sugar pill. And indirectly you are saying if H 1 is right, then your active molecule is better than a sugar pill, because theta is greater than theta naught for the sugar pill. Okay. So, that might be the form of the alternate statement that you are trying to prove. So, again notice the subtle thing, the direct statement that the pharma company could have taken up to prove is H 1. Okay, where you are saying theta is greater than theta naught, active molecule better than sugar pill, but notice that they are not doing that. Instead, they are taking on the question my molecule equals a sugar pill and that is H naught and then you are trying to disprove H naught rather than trying to prove H 1. 
uh, alternate form of this alternate hypothesis is when you say theta takes on a unique value theta 1 which is not theta naught. So, for example, somebody says I do not believe that the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8, but I believe it is exactly 9.6. So, now you are setting up a fight between 9.8 and 9.6 in terms of the two statements that you have. Okay. Notice that h naught has an equality in its statement and that is a very important feature in the design of a hypothesis test. So, why do we need an equality? So, when I say equality I can also put greater than equal to or less than equal to, but at the least I need an equal equality in an H naught statement. So, why do I need an equality? So, it turns out that the moment you say something takes on a precisely a certain value, we now have ourselves a distribution we can work with. For example, the moment that hypothesis about heights is that the average human height is 3 feet, I now myself have for myself a normal distribution of heights centered around mu naught which is 3 feet. Okay. So, what is the problem with not having inequality? If you tell me that the average height is not equal to 3 feet and you set that up as a null hypothesis, then I have nowhere to place my curve because remember this curve has to be centered around a mean and what you have just said is you do not know what the mean value is. And in fact, all you are telling me is that you do not agree with the mean value I propose of 3 feet. So, therefore, this curve is sliding to the left or to the right okay, and does not find itself um, a central value to sit around. And the net result is if you do not know where the curve is sitting around, around which central value, you do not know where the goal posts are for your test. Because the goal post is this interval within which we will accept a null hypothesis. Okay. So, it is critical for us to set up a pair of goal posts which do not shift and the only way you will set up a pair of goal posts which do not shift is by saying that at the center of this goal post is mu naught and the only way that will happen is if the null hypothesis that you are setting up is mu equals mu naught. So, in other words you are now forced into a position where the statement of your test is mu equals mu naught gravity equals 9.8 meters per second square and in a very narrow sense all you can now test is is the value 9.8 meters per second square reasonable or not. So, your hypothesis test now is focused around that unique narrow claim. So, what your hypothesis test does not help you do is to simultaneously evaluate a statement about whether gravity could instead of 9.8 could it be 9.7 instead. Because the moment you talk of an alternate 9.7 value. Now, that is a central value it in its own way and so your curve has to shift in, in this case it will shift to the left to be centered around 9.7. Okay. So, just to recap a uh, hypothesis as implemented via a null hypothesis statement has always got to be an equality and the reason it has got to be an equality is because you have got to be able to anchor a distribution around this average value that you are proposing for your parameter and that in turn allows you to fix the goal post and the goal post in turn will allow you to decide on whether your measurements are reasonable with the claim or unreasonable depending on whether your measurements fall inside the goal post or outside. So, before we kind of go ahead you can see that the major task in a hypothesis test involves now figuring out where the goal posts are in any test. And we talked briefly yesterday about how okay, each variable has its own units. So, if you are talking about a distribution of heights and we are making a claim about what the average height should be of a person, then there is a goal post possibly using the units of feet or inches. Alternately, if you are talking about weights as a variable, you have a different set of goal posts and it becomes problematic trying to ask what is the probability within the goal posts under the curve under the probability distribution. Okay. So, we said that there is a convenient way to deal with having to constantly compute probabilities under the curve and we said that that was the standard normal distribution and how did we get the standard normal distribution? You take for yourself a variable in this case okay, if our measurements individual measurements follow a normal distribution n with mean mu and variance sigma square and by the way if x was our individual measurement 
do you remember that x bar was also a random variable okay but x bar now is following a normal distribution also with mean mu okay but with variance sigma square over n okay so we have got two types of distributions to look at and again remember that we only start looking at x bar from now on we forget about individual measurements but anyway in either case how do you take this and make it free of units so what you need to do is to transform and normalize or standardize so how do you do this take a variable subtract from it its mean value as you propose it in other words mu and divide it by the standard deviation sigma and the net result is this is now a transformed variable which follows an n01 distribution as it's called okay in other words the mean of z will turn out to be zero because you have just shifted all your values relative to the mean anyway and the variance has already also ended up being changed the variance now turns out to be one because you have essentially divided by sigma and you have rescaled all your data so this turns out to be convenient because all you need to now do is if you transform your data before you get into a test you can go look up probabilities under the standard normal distribution which you will find at the in an appendix in practically any statistics textbook including the ones i listed out yesterday so since finding these intervals on the standard normal are important these goal posts will obviously end up determining the outcome of the test and you need to go to the probability tables for this just introducing a new piece of notation to you previously i defined my intervals using that parameter delta we said okay our goal posts are going to be a distance delta away from the mean on either side but now when i standardize things my mean becomes zero okay and the goal posts are better defined in terms of the area outside the goal post and since i already gave myself a notation for the area outside the goal post okay as alpha okay that notation now for the goal post is is in terms of the variable z and the subscript alpha by 2 reflects how much area exists to the right of that particular goal post so this alpha becomes more and more important to us so what is alpha so let's start with a kind of formal definition and um, i'll leave it for those of you who have done some basic statistics courses so the formal definition is that we are interested in what the error could be in our estimate okay of the mean so we are trying to find mu we have x bar as our point estimate of mu we know x bar is a variable so we could be getting our measurement of mu wrong so x bar could vary from day to day on us so therefore we need to figure out what could the error in our estimate be and we have to talk in the language of probability so therefore we end up if you do the algebra realizing that the error in our estimate depends on our choice of the goal post therefore alpha it depends on the variation we are seeing with our data that is sigma and it depends on the number of samples that we have that that is n and this maximum error is less than that term i show you there in the box with probability 1 minus alpha so alpha is a probability 1 minus alpha is also a probability okay and the interpretation of 1 minus alpha as a probability is more critical to us rather than the mathematical definition itself in this formula so let's jump to that straight away so what is alpha so let's step back for a second and realize that actually when we are testing h0 versus h1 that there are four possible outcomes okay this is actually very easy to see with a diagnostic kit so again i'm going to use an an example from biology so think of a diagnostic kit let's say there's a kit to test whether somebody has tuberculosis okay so what what could that kit end up doing for you that kit could end up saying that you have tb when the reality is that you truly have tb but then once in a while the kit could get things wrong the kit could say that you don't have tb when you have tb and conversely the kit could say that when you do not have tb it could wrongly accuse you of of having tb and finally there's also the scenario that you do not have tb and the kit also agrees that you do not have tb tb so there are four possible outcomes to a test depending on which way okay you look at it in terms of the outcomes for an h not and the truth behind what's going on so if i quickly list all of these we are accepting h not as true when in fact it is true we are accepting h not as true when it is untrue which of course means h1 is true 
we are rejecting H naught as true when in fact H naught is true, and we reject H naught as true when H naught is untrue. Okay, H one is true. So, out of these, which ones do we really want to hope that our diagnostic kit correctly identifies and solves? Okay, what you want is obviously to correctly identify a person whether they have the disease or not have the disease. What you, in other words, want to minimize are the mistakes in identifying or classifying a patient. Okay, so it turns out alpha therefore has an interpretation in the context of misclassification. So let me show you this in terms of a truth table. So on the top we're listing the truth of it. On the left we're talking about the decision that could be taken. In this case, the decision or the result of that diagnostic kit. So our four outcomes I'm writing in a matrix or tabular form. So if you look at the interpretation of this matrix, okay, in particular if you look at what happens to us with the lower left term H naught is true, but H one is accepted, that's the pink area in the plot, that's the pink term in the matrix. So what's the interpretation of this? So it is possible that the hypothesis test so the hypothesis in our test is true but we decide we think that we should instead go with the other conclusion so let me immediately go back to before we go ahead let me go back to that coin toss example so remember we tossed a coin 100 times okay so the null hypothesis h naught should be that the coin is a fair coin in which case okay what we are testing is that the number of heads we get is 50 so h naught according to h naught if the coin is fair i should be seeing 50 heads okay now we do the experiment and we find that we get 15 out of 100 tosses as heads 1 5 so what should i then do so should i call 15 and a very unlucky example of an event where it's actually a fair coin being tossed in which case i should be accepting h naught okay in which case i should be plotting my 15 relative to this curve because remember this curve is being plotted the moment we say h naught is true if h naught is true the mean value is mu naught which is why my curve is centered around mu naught okay so mu naught is 50 and relative to 50 i see 15 which means i'm at the extreme left of this curve and if i'm at the extreme left of this curve okay the question now comes up should i okay accept h naught despite it being an extreme result or should I go with the conclusion that H naught is wrong and assume that the coin is therefore biased and not okay, fair. So you can see that once in a while as we perform our experiments we run the risk of a phenomenon actually being okay but because the measurements we have seen are so extreme 15 out of 100 tosses okay, our measurements are so extreme that it becomes more compelling for us to reject the null hypothesis and go with some other hypothesis. So, in other words, this is an error of a certain type. We are committing an error because the truth okay, was that H naught was correct, but because we happen to by sheer bad luck see an extreme measurement, okay, we now start doubting the truth of H naught and find it easier to go with H1. But then technically what we have committed is an error. Okay. So, some fraction of the time therefore we are committing an error about H naught and therefore that then turns out to be the interpretation of an alpha. So alpha as it is known in the statistics literature therefore reflects the significance level of the test that we are performing. Okay. It is called a type 1 error H naught is true but H 1 is accepted. So of course what we want to do for example if you want a good diagnostic kit is we do not want to be committing these mistakes about whether somebody has a disease or not. So we do not wish for mistakes therefore it boils down to saying keep alpha as small as you can because alpha now reflects the likelihood of making a mistake okay, in the outcome of a test. So again remember that we are trying to disprove an equality and that the equality statement is now carrying the entire burden of proof with regards to the hypothesis test. Okay. Again going back to the legal system, think of this, the legal system prefers that we try and disprove H naught that 
x is innocent. So, okay. Notice that we are not setting it up as x is guilty. We are not trying to prove h not x is guilty. Instead, we are setting up x is guilty as h one, which in turn means h not is x is innocent. And what we are trying to therefore now go about doing is trying to disprove innocence. Okay. So if I now connect what goes on with the legal system with what you have just said about falsifying a hypothesis, okay, the accused is innocent and that is our H naught until proven guilty and that is our H 1 and this must happen beyond reasonable doubt which is alpha. Okay. So, alpha is the possibility of error that we wrongly accuse somebody okay, despite them being truly innocent. So, the moment you do this question comes up what is a good value for alpha. So, alpha intuitively should be small because we want to minimize errors, but what is a good value for alpha. So, convention typically in most domains is to set alpha to 0 0.05 which of course means 95 percent of your measurements will hopefully fall within the goal posts. Okay. So, but it varies from domain to domain and in some domains people go with 0 0.01 and particularly in manufacturing and for that matter even in some okay, areas of biology it is set to 0 0.001. So, in other words you want a really really small chance of committing an error. So, if, if you decrease alpha you are reducing your chances of committing that type of error where H naught was inherently true, but you prefer to go with H 1. Now, if there is an alpha there must also be a beta and so beta is that other type of error where H 1 was true not H naught, but H 1 is true and instead you decide to go over with H naught. Okay. Now, rather than try and show you show it to you in terms of equations there is an easier way to see this. Okay. So, we will assume that the null hypothesis is mu equals mu naught as before, but this time I will assume that h 1 the other hypothesis is mu equals mu 1 and the reason I am assuming mu equals mu 1 is at the moment I say h 1 is mu equals mu 1 it allows me to sketch an alternate distribution this time centered around mu 1 and for the ease of understanding I am also going to assume that mu 1 is greater than mu naught, but nevertheless what I say is perfectly true even if mu 1 is less than mu naught. Okay. So, if I say that I have a null hypothesis H naught okay, that immediately allows me to sketch a distribution according to the null hypothesis H naught centered around the value mu naught because that is what the whole null hypothesis is about we are making a statement mu equals mu naught. So, at this point a parameter has been identified to have a particular value I have identified a distribution that could explain the observations that I see according to that particular parametric value. On this distribution I have put down a pair of goal posts and those goal posts are defined by alpha okay. and the interpretation so far is if I get measurements within the goal post then they are consistent with the claim H naught at the very least they do not disagree with the claim H naught. Okay. It is a subtle thing remember that somebody is not truly being proven innocent what is being shown is that not enough evidence has been demonstrated of guilt. Okay. So, technically if my measurements lie within this goal post though I am writing in the slide H naught is ok another way of wording it is okay, that we have not been able to prove H naught wrong okay. and in fact that is a slightly superior way of wording things because after all the way we are setting up for example, that drug trial is that we really wanted H 1 to win and a molecule to turn out to be a good molecule. We really did not want to focus on H naught being false, but we end up taking on H naught being false because that is the easier experiment to do. So, if I now plot on top of this H 1, so H 1 is now a statement about mu 1 not mu naught. Okay. So, again compare the two. So, I will go back and forth and you will see what I am talking about. 
initially we make a statement about u naught that is h naught. Then in my alternate statement I am making a comment about mu 1 and I have said that mu 1 is greater than mu naught. That means I can if mu if h 1 is right my observation should be following a different distribution centered around mu 1. But remember my goal posts were defined not by looking at h 1 my goal posts were defined by looking at h naught and in other words my goal posts were defined based on the choice of alpha. So, my goal posts already exist and now on my plot given the goal posts from h naught if I superimpose a plot for h 1 I quickly realize that h 1 is accepted if I follow the h 1 curve and currently based on the location of my goal posts I will only go with h 1 if my observations fall outside the goal post because after all if my observations fall within the goal post I have already told you that I go with h naught. Okay. So, therefore, the area that shade, shaded blue is a situation where h 1 could have been right, okay. but my measurements are falling within the goal post and because I have already decided that within the goal post I prefer to go with h naught I choose not to go with h 1 despite the fact that h 1 is right. Okay. So, the net result is I am committing an error I am committing an error where h 1 is right, but I choose to go with h naught within the interval that I am showing you. So, therefore, we have actually two types of errors to worry about and what is a, a bit of a problem is because I made up my mind to control the value of alpha first my goal post kind of got defined on me. Okay. And because the goal posts are defined I now might see a very large value for beta and that is what I am actually showing you in this cartoon a large value for beta. So, it is kind of like saying the diagnostic kit for tuberculosis correctly identifies people with the disease let us say 99 percent of the time. So, 99 percent of the people who actually have TB are correctly identified as having TB it is only 1 percent that alpha 1 percent who are not diagnosed as carrying the disease. But there was another type of error there which is you have somebody who does not have the disease they should have been diagnosed as not having the disease, but now the kit is making so many mistakes it is unfortunately and unnecessarily calling many people as tuberculosis positive. Okay. So, we got two types of errors and in trying to keep one error small there is always exists the possibility that you are creating a large error of another kind.